The other thing that really sort of becomes problematic here is that um, large corporations essentially are able to manipulate the farm economy in a way that uh, is sort of unprecedented and kind of unheard of in most other places. And so the case comes of Prudential Real Estate or Prudential Insurance, who in 1981 bought 5,000 acres of olives, dumped them onto the market at extremely low prices, pushed out all the small farm competition in the area, and then bought up all of, that, all of those acres. Right? And so immediately, Prudential Insurance, who I'm sure all of you think of when you think of olives, <laughs> right, becomes the largest olive grower in California and eventually becomes the largest olive grower in the world. Right? And so people love to kind of be, you know, to, you know kind of uh, brag about California and say, we produce 90% of the world's olives or whatever, right? In reality, it's one corporation that's producing all of these olives, and as soon as they salinate the ground, they'll leave and go grow those olives somewhere else. And so this is one of the things that I think we really need, uh, ultimately, uh, to worry about. And then, sorry, I converted this from Keynote, so the images are a little off. Um, but uh, the other sort of major thing that we need to worry about here is environmental as well, right? These kind of economies of scale produce tremendous amounts of waste, and they farm areas that are not compatible to irrigated farming. And so the Westlands Water District likes to tell people in its brochures and it's kind of its publicity that we have some of the most fertile soil and beautiful soil in the country, in the world. We just need the water. But the reality of it is, is that the Agricultural Extension Services and a number of other people have done, Fres uh, have done like a Fresno soil tests on the land and we're dealing with really a sort of low class, like second, third class uh, uh, soil that's not really suitable for growing. The biggest problem that happens in the west side, in the Westlands Water District is that we have about two feet of clay. Oh. Yeah. So those of you who are sort of familiar with this know that when you sort of irrigate this land, the water doesn't seep back into the aquifers, right? It can't get through the clay. And so it gets run off into uh, the drain, right, into the San Luis, well, this was the San Luis drain. Uh, and it was supposed to go all the way out to here. So what they found was they, they started draining the water out here into the San Luis drain and created this thing called the Kesterson Wildlife Refuge. But what happened was it took the selenium and the salt and all the other sort of naturally occurring chemicals, but then, or elements and minerals, but then concentrated them in highly salinated, highly toxic soil or water that wildlife then made its home, which then ended up with massive, massive birth defects in, the in 1980, and which then had to be cleaned up by the federal government, right? Now, while I'm telling this whole story, I want you guys to keep in mind that all of us pay for the water of the Westlands Water District, right? Like this is, they don't pay for their water. These are federally subsidized water gifts, right, that they're getting from the federal government. And so when they have drainage problems on land that probably shouldn't be irrigated, we also pay for the cleanup. So that's the background. Here's my sort of work I hope is original, comes in. Does anybody know who this is? I read this man's stuff almost all my college career, and I finally, I finally saw a picture of him, and I never knew what he looked like. This is Paul Taylor. And so Paul Taylor was an economist at uh, UC Berkeley, and very well known for, uh, you know, he's one of the first people to write about Mexican immigrants and write about Mexican farm labor in California, uh, and is really sort of an expert on agriculture in California. Well, early on in his life, he's fighting tooth and nail to get the Reclamation Act enforced, right? He wants, uh, you know, he's writing governors, he's writing senators, excuse me, uh, you know, he's, he's constantly talking about it. He's on a, on a sort of a circuit of California to talk about this, this issue of 160 acre reclamations. And so he's been doing, he did it for most of his life, but then he runs into an individual by the name of George Ballas. Now, George Ballas was a photographer for the United Farm Workers 
And most of the sort of iconic shots that you see of the UFW, George Ballas took those photos. And so the, where he breaks his fast with Bobby Kennedy and he's sitting down in the chair and, he, you know, and he's eating a piece of bread, Ballas took that photo. Uh, the sort of long view lens march of, the, of the march to Sacramento with the Virgen in the front, Ballas took that photo. I mean, he was very much sort of a chronicle, chronicler of the UFW movement at the time in, the, in its early days in the 1960s, mid-60s. Um, he's, he also edits a newspaper in Fresno called the Valley Labor Citizen, which uh, was sort of the working you know, person kind of leftist or, uh, a newspaper in Fresno, uh, and is very active in a whole host of other cases and, and, and causes, I should say. But he meets Paul Taylor at one of these UFW functions, and he starts kind of telling, Paul Taylor starts telling him about this 160-acre uh, limitation and he gets very excited about trying to participate in this work and try to make this come to frui fruition. And so he meets with Caesar uh, and tells Caesar about this 160 acre limitation and he really feels like, uh, you know, at this point they really need to kind of create a critical mass around, this, around the reclamation law in an effort to, uh, you know, create this kind of political pressure to finally bring people to the table and break up these large land holdings. And he wants Caesar for the UFW to get involved in this, right? He says, this is sort of our chance for uh, farm workers. I believe in what we're doing here. I believe in the movement. Uh, but at the end of the day, as long as they're farm workers and they're farmers, these relationships of power will be unequal. And we need to really challenge it beyond this kind of unionization model. Unfortunately, uh, for whatever reason, there's some, I'm still digging through the archives trying to find all of the, all of the pieces of this conversation, but um, the letter that I have asking, when he's formally asking Caesar uh, to uh, support what they're doing in this organization that they're going to create, Caesar writes in big letters, no. And that's it. And so we don't really have a, that much insight yet. And I'm looking for it until like what is his logic. The little piece that I have ultimately, right, is uh, Dolores Huerta who is, as you know, a co-founder and a, and, a, and a negotiator for the UFW, an organizer, uh, during a 1972 congressional hearing on the status of farm workers. Uh, Senator Adley Stevenson over here on the right asked the UFW specifically, right, he asked Dolores specifically um, why the union was pursuing collective bargaining and improving the con or, and improvements in the conditions of farm workers, but not helping farm workers get their own land. And uh, Huerta was sort of dismissive and said, I quote, that's a nice dream, but where do you get the money to buy the land? But Stevenson, who had been a, who had been a confidant, right, of, of, or of Paul, of Paul Taylor, and another doctor named Ben Yellen in the Imperial Valley had studied the whole phenomena, had studied the law, had been really close with Paul Taylor, and he, he answers back, well, it's the 160 acre limitation. They wouldn't have to buy it at expensive prices. There's definitely a way that this could, this could happen. And so Adley Stevenson says to her, you seem to be more interested and preoccupied with simply negotiating and improving the working conditions of wage, of wage earners. And Huerta responded, Senator, if we are having trouble getting wages of $1.90 and $2 an hour for farm workers, and you're talking about making it possible for them to get, to get money to buy land, well, I think you have to be practical. And so the two continue to sort of argue back and forth at this hearing, not understanding, well, you, particularly Huerta not understanding that this land is not necessarily to be sold, right? Not necessarily to be bought. It needs to be broken up by the government. And the UFW sort of never really seriously consider this, right? And so I write about this moment as a moment of a kind of a missed opportunity where you have a critical mass, right? And we're talking, you know, in the, 19, the early 1970s, the UFW has its largest membership that it will ever have again, right? At this moment, right? Before it loses its, con its contracts to the Teamsters and, you know, things start to unravel for the UFW. And so George, Ben, Paul, who are all kind of sort of frustrated uh, with the inability or the kind of uh, 
the lack of desire for the UFW to get involved in this kind of movement or in this kind of thing. I spoke to Lori Huerta, uh, Dolores' daughter, a month ago, and she suggested to me that, you know, we were constantly under surveillance, and if we started talking about agrarian reform, and, you know, this is like revolutionary stuff, and, you know, Caesar's life, there was an attempt on Caesar's life at UC Davis, and like all these things, like, kind of, according to her, this was sort of the logic behind not getting involved in all of this. And again, I don't know that I'm completely into that yet, but that's one of the, one of the things that was offered. I don't know why that's blanked out, but it says big corporate farms. <laughs> Although I guess big could be pornographic in some sense, right? <laughs> when I first started this project, some of the people that I told the project about would suggest, suggest it to me, like, well, this is a sort of a utopian and never really had a chance to get off the ground. It was never really any, you know, this seems like kind of pie in the sky type things, you know, which is kind of a nice story, but in terms of history, it's not really all that relevant. What I've discovered is going through the, through the archive ultimately is that it was incredibly close. Right? It was incredibly close. There was an incredible amount of support behind it. Senator McGovern, one of being one of the largest sort of supporters of this. Uh, this is in the news all the time in the 1970s. Right? This is in the news all the time. This is a huge threat to corporate farms in California, and in particular the Westlands Water District, because unlike other areas of California, they've almost, they've almost exhausted their supply of well water. Right? And so to exist in any level in the Westlands, they need irrigation water. They can't exist without it. Okay? So this is something, and again, this is just one example, but there are thousands, I mean, I've like found hundreds of articles about this, about this happening in the 1970s. It gets congressional hearings, and ultimately what happens is um, the National Land for People, which is the organization that George Ballas founds in, in, in Fresno, ultimately uh, sue the, the Bureau of Reclamation for, un, for lack of enforcement of the law, one. And they also win an injunction right, against the Bureau of Reclamation to cease uh, what it will essentially were fraudulent land sales. Right? And so one of the ways in which the farmers continue to maintain these large corporate farms is by selling their land that put them under right, a said acreage into dummy corporations, into fictitious people, into you know, trusts, into this whole other kind of skirting around the law. Ballas and his team, uh, a lawyer named Maurice Lu 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 Mary Louise Pratt, uh, Patton, uh, or excuse me, Frampton, uh, George Ballas, his wife Maya Ballas, a small farmer by the name of Burge Verbullion, they all do an insane amount of legwork. Start doing public request records, start tracking down the names of the people on these lists. They start going through these uh, deeds of sale and they ultimately put together, I couldn't get a good photo of it because it's about the size of two tables, right? Of California, of all the parcels that have been passed out around and, 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 and sort of sold between owners, all operating under the same, you know, sort of label. And so they win and they get an injunction at the federal at the federal level to stop and to cease all uh, land sales until an investigation could be done. Right? And this is again what I was ma mentioning earlier. This is 1980, so the whole decade this fight is going on between National Land for People and uh, the Westlands Water District. And ultimately by 1980, it's the Congress's top priority. Right? This is again. This is not some utopian kind of hippie community, you know, trying to enforce some archaic law. It's something that's really, really getting uh, serious attention at the national level. The other half of this, right, is that um, I think it might work nicely into what you're speaking about today is that some of the members of the UFW in Fresno County and the Fresno Field Office actually disregard Caesar's uh, 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 orders to not participate in this movement. And a guy uh, by the name of Arnold De Leon, his wife, Je or Arnold De La Cruz, his wife, Jesse De La Cruz, Sal Gonzalez, and Ray Jimenez all begin. Uh, essentially cooperative farming ventures in the Western Water District at size uh, and 40 acre plots. Okay? 
And this is an article about them. And so uh, this was, again, the, the preliminary stages. Unfortunately, Arnold and Jesse passed away. Uh, I do uh, know Bobby, their son, who also worked on these farms, so I'm speaking uh, with him at the end of the month. Uh, but I'm really sort of interested here, right, to see what some of those potentialities, what some of those possibilities are of farming your own land and the kind of challenges they faced. One of the UFW organizers that I interviewed, who was familiar with this group of people, said to me, uh, these guys are nothing but labor contractors. And so uh, that's an interesting take, right? And so I don't know what the reality of the situation is at this point, but this is kind of the direction that I'm going in and try to figure out, is this really a viable option, right? Did, were they able to sort of create some kind of alternative uh, to farm work, right? And, and, and have their own land. Um, uh, this is, I think, ultimately sort of going to feed into um, this kind of cooperative of small farmers in South Fresno right now called the Fresno Food Commons that are, you know, buying their produce from small immigrant farmers, uh, Sikh, uh, Hmong, Oaxacan farmers in South, in, in South County. And so this is kind of where I'm going to leave you guys and, 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 hand, and hand the, uh, the night over, the day, the, 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 the lecture over and see kind of what the other things happening in California are in the backdrop to this reclamation law. So thank you.